Okay, let's uh, continue uh, the morning with uh, the Phillips, uh, continuing on the diaphragm and geometry. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let me just recap what we uh, were talking about yesterday on the first uh, course. So um, the goal, the, the intermediate goal now is to prove the money monthly conjecture. Uh, in this case, where the base field is a number field, so the belly variety is defined over number number field, and I'm looking at a general irreducible closed sub variety of A. And the conjecture is that uh, the torsion points are as a risky dense uh, in X if and only if X is torsion closed So this is kind of the goal will be of today to, to complete the proof. Uh, and so one direction is, is kind of follows from the theory. I'll call it easy. So the torsion coset, that just means um, translate of an, an abelian subvariety by from the finite order as a general theory will give you this direction and actually we're just going to the other direction. And uh, some notation that I introduced yesterday, if you recall, um, well, you can think of the tangent space of A as um, C to the G. G will be the dimension of A. And um, there's a uniformizing map, polymorphic map into A, or onto A. The kernel is uh, a rank 2G uh, speed subgroup. And I've also fixed the basis. So this basis will allow us to identify C to the G with R to the 2G as, as an R vector space. And uh, so we sometimes consider just this map from R to the 2G into A. It's the real uniformizing map. And the kernel here is the C to the 2G. And the torsion points are precisely the images of the rational points here. So that's kind of the connection to the rational points. And uh, so final piece of notation that I had yesterday, this X, um, now graphic X, that would just be the pre-image under uh, this real uniformizing map of, uh, of X down to this. So this is, this is going to be definable in Rn. The only minimal structure that we just uh, heard about. It's definable. So for abelian varieties, we don't need the exponential function, well, because everything is compact. So this is one of the first, maybe historically, the first uh, O minimal structure beyond uh, setting up the sets, although sets are more. It wasn't known to be a minimal because of the terminology of this. It's probably a little steep. Okay, so I've already set up some things. I'm not going to uh, recall everything, but somehow the um, the point is that um, torsion points downstairs correspond to rational points upstairs. So if I have a point here of uh, order, <coughs> order T, then this will correspond to the rational point on X. Um, maybe it's better to write one over T. So we're going to count these rational points here on X, but a single one is not going to be enough because um, Kiwoki says something about points of high, high, high uh, High uh, bounded height, and so we, we use the Galois action, and that's the final thing I talked about yesterday. The Galois group, the absolute Galois group of K, so everything is contained in Q bar, and Q bar is the algebraic closure. You can see the Galois, <coughs> the Galois closure, um, the Galois group acts on P, and the orbit lies in X cap again, the collision of A. And in fact, all of it's here at the same order. So the question that I posed yesterday, what is the size of this orbit? Here's the green area here. That's the only <clears throat> so what is the size of here? And so there's an upper bound you can get if you know, size is at most piece to the 2G if the order is capital T, but we you want some kind of lower bound. And the lower bound <clears throat> represents the following theorem. Um, which is actually a consequence of an theorem of Ser, uh, written down, and probably also, I don't know if the first was to recognize it, 
but it was rebounded to down in favor of Hatsi. I'm silent, strictly positive. This guy will over here. Is of size at least t to the one minus epsilon. And the constant here, this means there's a multiplicative constant, and the multiplicative constant will involve um, some of the data that I fixed to start out with the value variety, the base field, and also the epsilon. So, uh, so the trivial bounds, call it again, is t to the 2g. That's not interesting for us. And what's important is that we get a. It's not important that we get one minus epsilon here. But anything strictly greater than zero, that's fixed in terms of creating is good enough for us. So let me also just recall the theorem of Serre that can be used to just get this theorem here. Around 80. 586, the course he gave a Collège de France. And uh, so what do we think we have? We have um, in this arithmetic setting, we have a representation of the absolute Galois group here on uh, the outer morphisms. Uh, torsion, points of order dividing T on the abelian variety. And uh, this is the same thing where it's isomorphic to G of two G of Z mod TZ. So because uh, the group structure is Z mod two, uh, TZ to the two G and this is GL two. So the, the theorem says that the image here contains the image Contains um, diagonal matrices. So um, I'll represent this should represent the diagonal matrix multiplication by two m to the s for all all integers m that are co-prime t. And this exponent here is some function of a. It's a natural number. <clears throat> so the theorem says that if I'm looking at this representation of the Galois group on the uh, torsion, I always uh, find homotopies like this, where uh, I get some exponent that it's unspecified here, but it's just some fixed integer that depends on our fixed data. And I'm allowed to plug in any integer here that's co prime to. Write it T. Of course, this is necessary. So, so notation means the homotopy. Yeah, that's that's uh, yeah, that's right. Homotopy is or diagonal matrix, whatever you want to see. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and once you have this, it's uh, quite straightforward to reduce um, this lower bound here. <laughs> Um, a, B. Can you just say the quantified says so there's this in X equals F with A? Yes. What, so, like G has to be bigger than I just can't be like G has to be bigger than that. So uh, no, so the S uh, well T can be uh, T is the order of so for all T, yeah, I forgot the quantity. For all two is one an integer, uh, which would be oh, but m to the s. Oh, because and the s appears t, here, right? Oh, so that has the effect of making it so t is really small, right? Here. So any kind of like slap goes into this. Yeah, and s depends heavily on a. Um, so a is fixed. So so a implies b. This is I think just an exercise. Oh, I'm sorry, b implies a. That's what. This is an exercise somehow in elementary number theory. I guess the idea is just to well to observe that the Galois group here 
act on the p has to be orbit is at least now um, the number of points here. M minus three mod. So this, just this order here, and this is the same thing as the other function here. The value of t, the number of points, elements here, divided by the kernel, which is the uh, number of m you know, easy. units m to the s. And so we know how the Euler, the Euler function grows grows almost like p. So there's somehow a t to the one minus epsilon here, and this can be bounded to above by a t to the epsilon. So we get a two epsilon. The effect is just this is grows like uh, t to the one minus epsilon, and the constant here will depend on on this at some moment. That's some kind of long term. Instead of, yeah. Yeah, so, are there bounds known on this uh, S of A as a function of the hybrid? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not quite sure if there are effective bounds here, but there are effective bounds for, for something like this here. For this, I'm not sure if there are effective bounds known for this. Do we have on the X? I think for Lifty curves, this yeah. kind of polytron, I just don't know the proof for the. Perhaps for well, yeah, for perhaps I think it's a fact. Uh, yeah, that's uh, maybe for the explanation why there's quite a straightforward reduction to exogeny estimates uh, by master. But it, yeah, exogeny estimates are not pretty straightforward to see. But, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is kind of a deep. So, yeah, I'll, I'll also mention the result of master. Um, so there's kind of a connection also to transcendence theory. So around the same time as as Xer uh, had this theorem for the to cross, um, Master is the following. Now this is there's a paper on this, and then there's also a letter to W. Okay, oh, I know. Mention the result statement in the letter. Um, so for any finite field extension of K, uh, so this predates um, this predates isogeny estimates. And for all epsilon strictly positive, the number of torsion points that are f rational is bounded from above um, by a constant times the degree over of the fields here. And then there's an exponent g plus epsilon. There's a dependency design. <coughs> so, <clears throat> this is a roughly around the same time as Sears theorem. It gives us an upper bound for, um, well, the full torsion of some, any extension of K. Um, for example, you could just take the extension generated by P and then you'll recover that, well, the order of P is order T, this lower bound, that equals to P. And then, this will be specialized in the Galois orbit size. And so you get a lower bound for the Galois orbit size that is roughly t to the one over g, <clears throat> which is also fixed in function of, um, of the, the initial data. It just depends on t. No more. Um, uh, 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 I mean, you put the t when you want to do it. So we basically let it go up over k, not to. Uh, so, so this is if I specialized in this case here. And if P is the order of P, then in this case, this will be the order of the gap. P is a particular point. But the one thing is you can't get a, um, you need some quantifiers, right? Because you can only go to some field where all the straight versions, the P version is defined. Well, I guess somehow, um, Like the orb, you can never guarantee that the orbits aren't just a size one until you go high up in T. Right? Well, so the constant here will depend on the phase field, which is somehow fixed. Oh, yeah, and that's the opposite. And what's moving, P is moving somehow in the abstract function. And uh, 
So you have to keep track of the base field at all times. And, and so this is kind of using techniques from transcendence theory. Um, and these eventually can be made effective. So all these constants can be computed. There's the, the, the optimality of this exponent. So it's not exactly the same exposure as here because we're kind of measuring something larger than Sierra did. But the optimality of this exponent is, I think, um, so it's still the best possible known exponent. <laughs> The conjectural best known exponent, I think, is still computed or expected to be related to the month or take of the dividing line. Okay, so that gives us lower bounds. So they're two different. Let me just say that there are many different ways to compute uh, these lower bounds for bounding rights. If you want to do everything over the multiplicative group, um, it's some essentially elementary algebra or elementary number theory because then you're just asking what is the degree of our root of unity over. Um, the rationals, and that's given exactly by the other function here. And uh, as soon as you're talking about other varieties, things become more sophisticated and uh, you need these, uh, these deeper results. Okay, so that kind of concludes this excursion to Gal orbits. Uh, <clears throat> are there any questions, further questions? Fine. Okay, so the next step would be um, applying in my part three, four, that was part three, applying you all will keep. <laughs> so this will be the first application of you all will keep. And in this course, and this will be the second one uh, later. <clears throat> so uh, this recap is here. So I would assume that well, I have a point of order. K is fixed, and I have a point of order. <laughs> order T. And essentially, we're going to assume that T is large enough, eventually, um, because yeah, if you want to prove that this, if you want to have a conclusion of the hypothesis that this is a risky density, then we can just assume that we have a lot of torsion points, assume that they're large. And okay, so we know that. X uh, P leads to some so X lowercase X in our definable set and it's uh, it's going to be rational denominator um, of T and um, well I can always just add a sigma here properly with the quantum quantifiers here if I have any element in the Galois group I get some new points. And I get another rational point here. The Galois group is the number of variants. So the number of rational points I get as I vary sigma is exactly the size of the Galois orbit. And as we saw before, I can bound this from below by the constant times. Uh, T to the one minus. So I'm not going to care about the epsilon anymore because we're going to have another epsilon. So I'm just going to say T to the one over two, which is good enough for everything. I can also write T to the one over a million here. It won't make a difference because the method is robust. <laughs> now, so remember that. Aha. Uh -huh, so we were in the interval of zero one. Now remember what is the height of a point? The height, <laughs> as we saw in Tom's talk, is um, the height of a rational number. If we're in lowest terms, the height of A over B is just the maximum of numerator and denominator. Now, well, our points here are all in 0, 1 through 2G. And the denominators are bounded by T, and the numerator also has to be bounded by T because the quotient is 0, 1 to 2G. So at the height of these points here are all going to be height. So this is a tuple, but it's just the height is the maximum up here. <laughs> so this is now we're ready to set up uh, to meet flight to work. What, what have we done?
conclusion. <laughs> the number of rational points. Of height at most t is at least t to the one half. If I have a point of, of order t, so what does Pula Wolfe say again? So in, in this special case, I mean, just there are all O minimal structures, but we're in R and expansion of the field fields. So for all so another epsilon, all epsilon strictly positive, there exists a constant that depends on the epsilon and the definable set with for all t the number of rational points of height of this t. <coughs> Is bounded by the constant times t to the upside. Got something here. Attention, very good. So I forgot, of course, the importance you are. We have nothing to tell us anything about semi algebraic sets. Semi algebraic sets, there's one more for a more delicate conjecture, would happen. And um, we can't get anything out of at least out of the statement, as we saw in Rostock yesterday, so the, the techniques. In terms of controlling the number of points, we have sort of a high degree variety. Yeah. If, if, yeah, as we saw in Rostock, the techniques that go into the proof can also say something about the semi occupied case. Uh, but they will not be able to say anything more in the context of this theorem, because as we'll see, as, as the conclusion is sharp in a sense, right? So we, we, even though we can kind of Right, there's a more advanced version of this theorem that can also deal with something that's smaller than this here, but it doesn't give us, this, it can't give us a stronger conclusion of this level. So what is the R that just we removed? There are different equivalent ways of writing it down. Here's one way. We remove everything from X at the following shape. R is contained in X and it's a real semi-algebraic connected curve. We always want it to be connected, otherwise we could just add points and start removing all points. That wouldn't be fair. <laughs> uh, but so it has to be connected. And sometimes um, I think maybe in, in different versions of the, this theorem we saw uh, a real semi-algebraic infinite connected set. Um, you get the same thing if you remove curves because you can cover any set by curves. So this is kind of the set uh, we have to deal with. And okay, you see the two bounds kind of contradict each other if I didn't have this and if T is large enough. So in the application, I mean, we just take, take epsilon something less than a half, like a third. And the conclusion is, the yeah. basic conclusion is, if I find, if I have a torsion point on X that has sufficiently large order, then, the corresponding x sigma, one of the corresponding x sigma has to lie in this algebraic part. That's the kind of the conclusion. It exists a point x on the torus of large over t, <laughs> then uh, some x sigma, so there's some Galois conjugate upstairs, is contained in a real semi algebraic curve, which is contained completely in. There's going to be a line, isn't it? I mean, it's going to be a. Uh... Yeah, that's kind of your 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 way ahead of me at this point, right? So it's going to essentially be it has to be a line, but this is going to be a consequence of a further further theorem. Yeah. 
So this is a real semi-algebraic. So this this x actually it's, like, it's in some box and it's an x sigma here. Kind of looks like this. I mean the curve can, can, can look complicated. It's just supposed to be connected, but it could be sort of like could branch off and could be singular, but I'm gonna forget about all that. So you can you can make the curve smaller. And you, you can assume that the curve is starts at x and x sigma, and that it's completely analytic apart from maybe this, the endpoints. <clears throat> so but this is yeah, this is extremely strong restriction already, because so we heard that we eventually turn out that this has to be essentially a line, but this it, that follows then from another application of the Kilo Wilkie theorem or a <clears throat> Um, or from an older theorem actually acts. This is where functional transcendence comes into the picture. So here enter functional transcendence. Why is this situation, um, why is this a strong restriction on the whole setup? Well, you can think of the following situation instead of Value varieties or um, uniformizing maps coming from theta functions, you just think of the exponential function. X. And in a sense, we're looking at the, the analog of the situation is we would be looking at. The image of some well, semi-algebraic curve under the exponential function or products of the exponential function in uh, in C2. Right. So this is semi-algebraic curve, it's just this parabola tp squared. And if this is an exercise. The image of this, even if I restrict to some small interval like zero one. The image of this will be Zariski dense in C2, right? Because there's no relation between xt and xt squared. But here, the image of the semi algebraic curve under the uniformizing map it lies in the image of x. So, in particular, it lies in the image of the, the, the variety. So, the image of this one is not Zariski dense. Except of course, if x is a, if x is everything, uh, except that we well, can exclude that. So, um, so this is the risk of dense, um, and so this that poses a strong restriction on the kind of curve. And an example where the restriction, uh, where, where the image would not be the risk of dense, is uh, something like this. If instead of t squared, I had t times two, then I just get a relation uh, x squared equals y. So in this kind of setup with no line, just as um, asked before, the image will be contained in this. So essentially what will happen is kind of something similar. There, there is a functional transcendence theorem that acts in the 1970s that says, okay, uh, which also holds in this multiplicative case, that says in this um, rebellion case, um, R will essentially be a lot. But uh, maybe you skip this type of function, but uh, at the moment we just have one point on the semi algebraic Right. One point. We just have one line, right? But, but no, we'll line. Mm -hmm. on this line, there's only one point that we took. No, something about it. Right. No, but he wants to show he has one point and he wants to show that uh, he can, uh, he takes, uh, he has a right species for this is in the. Let's assume that we have it's a risky dead set of points to start out with. Then we can do this construction for all of them. Then the whole thing will be covered by these by these phase curves. And that's what we'll propose to eventually want to get to here. Right? And a single point is not going to help, but if we have a risky dead set of points like this, then uh, we'll be able to 
A single point will also imply something non trivial for X. Let's see. We only want to make you a different semi. Each point will be found that we're only going to be in a different semi to so, buy. Yeah. Then what do you do? Well, this is what I'm going to explain. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So what happens then? Um, so let me write down the theorem first uh, of Axe or a conclusion of the theorem of Axe, the special case of it. And then I'll be able to well, let's quickly, quickly reduce the full theorem there. Axis theorem, sometimes called Axe Shadowall. So A, the civilian variety A, implies the following theorem, which is sometimes called Axe Lindemann wire. So this this R I've had here, there's the image. I don't want any branching going on. I want R to be semi-algebraic and also I don't this is one of the trivial counterexample. The theorem implies that if I take the image of this R, you'll send me up the right curve. And nice enough, so it's like one And I take the Zariski closure. So now this is a, a uniform. I, I'm, I'm back in the abelian variety. So I'm back in the world of algebraic varieties. I'm in here. I take the Zariski closure of this one here. This is a translate <coughs> of an abelian subvariety. Well, at this level, you don't get the torsion point. So the torsion point will be okay. So in this particular case, the torsion point, or at least the North Gallo conjugate, will lie in this because it's, it comes from here. And so this will actually be even translated from the value separated by a point of finite order. And where can you get the torsion point? The torsion point, um, well, we're counting rational points upstairs in the universal cover. And <clears throat> they come from, from the Galois orbit of the torsion point downstairs in the value value. <clears throat> and by application of P.O. Wilkie, one of the rational points upstairs is contained in the semi algebraic uh, you start to use a torsion. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Yes. And so this, so this is kind of all in the context of the proof. And the original point, or at least the Galo conjugate, will be contained in this trans. And this has has dimension. Of course, it has dimension greater than zero because the curve we started out with is a curve. So there are too many points. Um, uh, here at this context, not except that it's okay. It's not like so. It's not like something like this. It's kind of in a sense analytic germ of, of a curve. So it's just a semi-algebraic curve passing through point that's also sufficiently smooth. German. So, in a sense, it's the same thing happens here. How do you get the smoothness? Well, so this is kind of a general principle for real algebraic geometry, semi algebraic geometry. I assume I have a semi algebraic curve, then there's going to, I can parametrize, at least a portion, I can parametrize it by um, at least a, a portion of it in the unit interval. And then by, by the general principle, like a little geometry that also semi-algebraic geometry, some, some small like portion of this map will be real and all of it. So I can just make this R a bit smaller. But then you lose your portion for the yeah. 
No, no. So the point X, you can start parametrizing at, at X, like for no, example. No, no, no. So point your, I, I lost the brain, but from the algebra side, the torsion point you have yeah. uh, might be highly singular on your uh, negative curve. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. <laughs> Well, maybe just this is smoother than saying he wants an irreducible component. So, I mean, this would be true when R is just any analytically irreducible component. If you have several components, you would just get several of these torsion constants. That's the only thing. No, no, but it, it could be a curse or it could be a. Okay, but it's not it's irreducible, it's what is written as correct. There are very few singular points. You can control the degree of the curve. No, she's yeah. just worried that the point, the yeah, yeah. itself is yeah. on the cusp, but in fact, it's if you take if the, this, the if, whole cusp, it's still true. If this happens yeah. or this happens, this these are two things that could happen in principle. I, I agree. So this would be the point X. But I can parametrize this curve along the like the smooth part. And here I can just start parametrizing mm -hmm. through the cusp. Or you can forget all of the thing. Yeah, at this point I forgot the point. Yeah, so I'm different. So, so the, the, the theorem in, in omitable geometry, there's a theorem that I think we saw in, in Thomas' talk and it holds in high generality. Okay, this theorem holds uh, not in all omitable all 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 structure, but if I have a definable map from zero, one to uh, R to the N, then uh, on some sub interval zero to the epsilon, it'll be continuous. This is holds in all omitable structure. And I, in, in, in this particular one, Rn, I can see, assume the epsilon is small enough such that on the open interval, the map will be uh, analytic. Mm -hmm. So some omitable structures have the property that have analytic cell composition, and among them is Rn to them. Yeah, but I think the yeah, is just worried that you take the open interval and not the closed interval, because you say it needs to be smooth. <laughs> the first point, the point is not in the open interval. Yeah, it's at the end point. Yeah, but I mean, that's what you're concerned. That's why you get it. And the I, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't want to. I mean, if they move this point and then map it by as a uniformization to your initial addition variety, the conclusion is that uh, it's going to be inside and dense in a translate of the Nadinian variety. I forget the torsion point as Mark was suggesting. Mm -hmm. Now you take a uh, you're really your R. Now, this R is going, and if it was highly singular, it's going to land in the Zarsky closure of, of the alpha in the R. Maybe that's what people said, but she said. And there's no singularity there. So, um, there's something interesting. So, the, the R here doesn't, the R doesn't see X at all, the capital X. At this point, I don't see capital X at all, except that what the R is contained, the image of R is contained in capital X. I mean, one thing, like the dimension of R would be like odd real dimension, right? Exactly. And the dimension of the closure is even real dimension. So, so I mean, if the thing is singular, I mean, it's kind of the singularity in the odd dimension, I'm not going to translate over to the singularity in the closure. So, so here is there's any relationship between those two. So the dimension of R here is one. One, yeah. And the real the dimension of the real semi-algebraic set. One, one yeah. So as in this, as in this example here, so here the R would be parameterized by P squared. The image of this map here in C two. I mean, if I let it run over all of real C, then it'll be some some awful thing. Um, or, or complex areas, but I'm just looking essentially at the germ. And this slide is a risky dense. And in the end, X, I mean, the conclusion X is extremely regular. I mean, X doesn't, will not have singularities at all. No, I'm not aware of that. Yeah, as, as yeah, a I'm not aware of that. <laughs> so maybe I'll, I'll be able to convince you in the break. No, I have no doubt about C. It's a theory. It's like, really care about smooth. It's like the analytic irreducibility. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, I just want I just want that this is a risky closure to be irreducible. So I don't want anything going on like like R is, is this, and then there's some some branch here or some branch there that would lead to new components. That's something I'll avoid. So I want to make R small enough so that this is irreducible.
Oh, that's the thing. That's the point with the singularities. You could R could be irreducible. But if it's very similar, it could like if it's similar, it could still have like two components of some quantity. So I'm, I'm not sure about concepts of pure reducibility in the semi-algebraic yeah. you know, semi-algebraic setting. So I I, I prefer just to say that it's kind of a germ of a curve that's real I'm over. So the so R is somehow the map the image of the map from zero one to R to the QG with R this gamma is semi algebraic continuous and the restriction to zero one open is analog. That's all I want. This will apply that the zero closures at least irreducible. Okay, so let, let me just explain how if, if you take this for granted with theorem, then, then we can use that to conclude this implication that we're looking for. Okay. So this is a, a general definition in the value variety. So I think any sub variety X of A. And to find x naught, this is called the Ueno locus. That's the union of all. So this is, I don't want to always like translate the valid sub variety. It's called this a coset. And I'm thinking the union of all cosets of A that are not points. And contain completely inside X. The co said translate of Nobelian sub variety by an arbitrary point. I don't want zero dimensional things because otherwise I get everything. And um, this is the way of this. I know. Right. Right. By arbitrary points. Right. That's kind of. Uh, it's important with this time. Here's a concept with origin here, but that's not what we need at this point. <clears throat> Second point, um, well known stabilizer of X, not just a group of um, few of all points. The definition of process is for the distortion point. No, no, the torsion coset is torsion torsion okay. Okay. So, so this is any 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 points arbitrary. Okay. So stabilizer of X, I just uh, okay. X. Just this it's a group. Okay. Uh, and it's actually also an algebraic group. You can write this as X plus Q. And I intersect with all x, uh, all q and x. So we can close the group so it's not the So it's uh, so not the right subgroup, it's an adult variety, it's uh, the unit component itself is an adult sub variety. <coughs> so now there's, there's a structure theorem on this uh, renal locus, which uh, I'm not going to prove. Um, I'm just going to write down a few names. There are versions of this in several gen various generality. Forgetting people. So this is a general theorem on sub varieties and valid varieties. There's versions for, for other algebraic groups as well, like semi-valid varieties. 
So the first point of order is, well, this X naught is just a union of things. Um, things happen to be so risky close, but of course the union could well be an infinite union. So there's no reason to believe that the union is so risky close a priori, but the theorem states that it is in fact so risky close. X. And uh, it could well be that that's the first part. And the second part is that X naught is everything that could also happen. So this be closed. X, it could be everything that happens if and only if the stabilizer X has positive dimension. So if you think about it, what is having positive dimension, a stabilizer positive dimension mean? That means essentially X is covered by stable under translation by the whole stabilizer. And the stabilizer, the translates of the stabilizer will cover all every so this will be X and these lines here are translates. Yeah, uh, maybe I should check it what is lambda? Lambda? Uh, oh, I don't, I don't want one. Is that a one? It's a trench one. So it's, it's, it's an infinite. Simple. Okay. Okay, so now I'm, really, I'm not going to prove this theorem. But the idea here is that um, the, the main part is the first thing here that um, the main thing, main, main idea is if you have a coset containing A and you, you assume that it's, it's a maximal coset containing A um, that, that okay. exists, then it's the translator of an abelian sub variety coming from a finite set. Uh, that's what, what you prove. And once you have that kind of statement, um, the rest is rather uh, So it's kind of a finiteness. <clears throat> And why are we done? This is this concludes everything, I think. Uh, I kind of covered some wrong stuff. <laughs> so, okay, maybe just it's orally. We assume that we have a Zariski dense set of torsion points. That's what we're, we're trying to prove left and flies right. We have a Zariski dense set of torsion points. And we can assume that, well, the order of the torsion points is sufficiently large. So as to um, um, I think I erased all the elements. So that was the application of pure wealthy. If P, okay, if A is a transverse proof of M. Sufficiently large order Q, we can assume this because what's going to be done. Then, um, what happens? This the whole machinery involving the Pure Wilkie theorem and the Galois orbit told us that P is contained in the image of, or at least some Galois conjugate of P is contained in the image of um, some real semi algebraic curve. Um, and of course, then it's contained in the Zariski closure of this image. And the Zariski closures can play, can, can, can take clean, completely in X, right? Because X is Zariski closed. But this is true for a Zariski dead set of points if we want to prove left and five right. So this guy here is in the weight locus 
of um, that this is the axial aluminum wire truss theorem that I, I cited over there without proof behind one of these boards. So the theorem is that this is a coset. It has positive dimension. It's contained completely in X, so it's in the way this focus. So and if this holds for a Zariski dead set of P, well, then the way to locus is a risky dance in X. But then this theorem here, which luckily is still on the board, this is a risky dance, so it has to be a And the stabilizer <coughs> is uh, infinite. We said that, like, why is this uniformization of R contained in X? Right. So the, the R came from essentially oh, is okay. it an algebraic locus of, of the thing upstairs. I see. And so it's, it's contained. This comes from the pure level. This exists. And so the image is an X, and then I think it produces the closure. I think. So now you use the fact that the stopping points are actually points are actually the stabilizer. I mean, R is in the stabilizer. So yeah. So the, the logic is so this is going to be a coset from X to the wire cross. It's contained in X. And if I want to prove the theorem, I can assume that this is a risky dense. So I do it for all points. We keep the process for all points. Then I find, okay, the Ueno locus contains a risky density of points. Now I use a structure theorem with this locus. It doesn't, okay, it has to be actually everything because it's a risky post. Everything, every point now is contained with the translate back of a singular value variety of positive dimension. And we get a unit component of this one here. So we're in this kind of range. And now, so the last step is now we're essentially finished because we can, we can bought out the stabilizer. It just takes the stabilizer. So consider the map that takes A to A mod of X. This exists as a Gallian variety, trying over some number fields, but the dimension is now less than the dimension. Maybe that modded out something that's a positive dimension. The dimension here is less, less than G. And essentially, X is being fibered by these stabilizers. So um, the dimension of uh, 5 X may <laughs> contain is a risky dense set of torsion points. So this one here, I call this P, which is a risky dense X, but I'm in lower dimension, so I can just do induction. And this will, so that this, this one here, 5 X, is, is a torsion. Translate, and then it's an exercise to show because I essentially modded out everything with the stabilizer, and the original X also has to be torsion translate. So my mod for for B implies five X is torsion plus done box variety. And now, uh, once you get it downstairs, you can just recover it upstairs because um, the fibers here are stabilized. I didn't yet, but <laughs> I haven't proved everything on the blackboard. And in fact, this is kind of the, uh, the second stage. Um, right, that's this. Um, that's this one here. The axial and the wire stress theorem. So I, I said that this is the earliest references on this theorem. We use it um, the axe theorem from the 70s. In the fact, there was a new proof, or there is a new proof of this theorem using the pure local counting um, theorem. So, new proof. Axial and the wire stress. And um, so that's not the not exactly the argument that was in, it's not the argument that was given in the pure local paper or the on the earth. 
But later, Jonathan gave it in his um, proof, actually, for one month, for, and Jonathan's paper for Andre York for Y1 to the N for a product of modular curves. Um, Axis theorem was not known for induction that we said even modular curves. So you have to develop a new proof, and the proof he used used the counting theorem. And in a sense, what um, you can do is you can adapt this new proof back to the evaluation situation. So in the case of a product of modular curves, it, it really new argument was necessary because there was no anything in the literature. And um, Uh, 2011 ran for, for Andre York for product of modular curves, and uh, was also later developed by, by various people. So it's this, this general approach to um, prove these kind of functional transcendence results, also using minimal techniques, was then developed in, in, in large generality by a large group of people. Maybe I'll just write down some names. I'm not going to go into it. Any uh, many details of the people are in the room? Uh, not everyone. So, regular. So, this is not then just contained to the algebraic group setting, but Jamur uh, variety setting, which Jamur varieties and beyond. In the way up life, or a compact. So in, in this compact setting for the value varieties, it'll again be enough. So I'm, I'm going to sketch this going to be uh, the last part of the mini course. I'm going to sketch it. the proof of the actually the Meyerstrass theorem using also a minimal geometry and the pure local counting theorem. And again, we're just going to be able to get along by, by using Rn because value varieties are compact. <laughs> In non compact settings that appear in the world of Shimura varieties, for example, or even for uh, GM at the end, you have to work with R and X. So you also have to do the exponential function if you want to uniformize the Shimura variety. You need the exponential function in general, so you can't just work with Rn. And um, <coughs> so let's say, in addition to that, So the sketch I'm going to give is prove this for yeah. So I want to also say that well, the actually the von Weierstrass is just kind of a special case of Hatch-Shannon, and it's, uh, so the general case has also been now established. And uh, these people, Pilat Zimmerman, all the others, um, in, in, in various more much more general context than specific by axioms, and, and they're also really necessary for. <laughs> Projecting them on York and, and, and its generalizations. Okay, so I think my time's up for today, and tomorrow I will continue on um, the proof sketch on axiom the money. And then say a few words about unlikely intersections towards the end. Questions or comments? Oh no, so there's two there's um there's for each P there's this new sigma because I mean the field of definition of P will eventually will become larger and larger. So um from this, but by this point, once you're at this step, you, you forget about forget about sigma and forget about P. Just remember that this works for as useful as you can also forget about sigma here because. Oh, this this you wait a locus to stay there. So so there were, I think I mentioned four names. So first was Serre from his college de France uh, lecture in 85, 86. That was the home of ethics and the Gallo representation. That was then um Used to get a lower bound for Galois that's in the paper for Patsy Muniel. And then there's also David Masser, and I, there are also other people I didn't mention 
who worked uh, using transcendence theory, a different approach to getting lower bounds for uh, the degrees of field of definition of quantum points and other bounds. With Volcom all had to do with the Sarah thing, yeah. The Sarah tour, I, I mean, yeah. I think Volcom all had some role in that. Okay, and I think also, Dante Berger also had a write up of this book. That can happen. I mean, Volcom has to be, you know. Uh, I, I would have to check that out. Okay. That, that paper. Yeah, exactly. Sarah wrote that paper, but here's five books. Vogel on the author. Well, it's uh, good for us. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I know, it's very really good paper. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, any other uh, comments, questions? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah.